Hi there, my name is Chris Wright and I'm an aquatic biologist at the University of Wisconsin-Platteville. First off, I'd like to thank you for all your time and effort spent monitoring streams. I imagine that as you've learned different techniques and how to use equipment in your monitoring practices, that you've come up with some questions about why am I measuring this exactly and what does this have to do with the overall picture of the stream itself? Well, what I'd like to try to accomplish is to help you answer some of those questions by providing you with some background into the basics of stream ecology. Now, before we get into the nitty gritty, one of the questions that we want to deal with is, well, why do we monitor in the first place? And to answer that, we need to think about, well, what do we get out of streams? What do they do for us? Why are we spending so much time and effort monitoring something? What is the value of that? I think the first thing that comes to mind when we think of a stream is the moving water. And perhaps the most important function that a stream has is moving water from point A to point B. In many senses, it's our land's irrigation system or gutter system. On a more philosophical perspective, we also have an amazing aesthetic appreciation for streams. They're just simply beautiful. We like to look at them. We like to listen to them. And in fact, I think you can buy a CD for $12.99 that is an hour long of babbling brooks. Just to give you an indication of how much we value just the beauty of streams itself. In addition to this, we also camp by streams and rivers. We fish in them, we bathe in them, we swim in them. We build our cities by them. We've acquired our riches from them. Much of California is based on this simple principle of washing gravel through a sluice box to settle out the gold and then make your riches. We drink water from them. And on the flip side, we put our waste back into them. So now that we have an appreciation for what streams can actually do for us and why they're important to us, I want to get into what is stream ecology itself. To understand this concept, perhaps what we really need to do is think about the second word in that phrase, and that is ecology. Ecology is this study of how organisms relate to one another and how organisms relate to the environment. So we can imagine an environment like a lake. A lake may have organisms in it like lily pads and frogs. And as ecologists, what we're interested in is, well, how does the environment influence the organisms, both the lily pads and the frogs? But the other component of ecology looks at how do the organisms influence one another? Now, stream ecologists simply take this very complex idea and put it within a stream context. The first thing that I want to talk about is the biota, or the organisms that we talk about within a stream. If you look in any basic textbook, maybe, that talks about stream organisms, what we might expect to find is a nice, simple food chain that illustrates that big fish eat little fish, and that the little fish eat invertebrates, and that the invertebrates eat algae. This is a common way, and, and not necessarily incorrect way, to think about streams. The problem is that it is not necessarily a complete way to think about the organisms in streams. And when we really consider all the things that live in a stream, this is probably closer to reality. We're talking about a whole suite that live within the community of a stream. Let me give you some examples and walk you through the different levels. We can start at the smallest level, the bacteria, the single-celled organisms that are involved in decomposition, we have things like protists, which are single-celled organisms as well. We have fungi. We have algae, which can be broken down into those that live within the water column, as well as those that live on the rocks themselves. So we have the paraphyton and the phytoplankton. We have macrophytes, seaweed, for lack of a better term. But basically, we can divide macrophytes into those that are submerged or underwater and the ones that break through the water surface or that are emergent. We move on to the animals, and we start talking about the macroinvertebrates. The macroinvertebrates are composed of many different groups, one of which is the aquatic insects, perhaps one of the more dominant groups in our streams.
we see things like the water strider, the damselfly, the stonefly, and the caddisfly. But the macroinvertebrates also include a, a suite of other organisms, including the arachnids, things like spiders and mites. They include the mollusks, the mussels, the snails. They also include crustaceans. I think many of us are familiar with the crayfish that live within our streams, but we also have smaller crustaceans like the amphipod or the isopods that we normally call scuds. Then we move on up in scale and we start talking about the classic organisms, the ones that we're most familiar with, the fish, ranging from very small minnows all the way up to largemouth bass and trout. But we also need to think about some organisms that we consider say semi-aquatic, organisms that live partly in the water and partly on land. This includes things like the amphibians, newts, salamanders, frogs, toads. The reptiles, the garter snake, the eastern painted turtle, both of which can exist partly within the water itself and swim quite well. Birds, birds from waterfowl to herons to raptors like osprey and eagles. And last but not least, we have the mammals, the otters, the beaver, and I must say the beaver, probably the only or organism other than humans that manipulates streams to a massive degree. Now that we have an idea of who lives in the stream and what the stream community is, I'd like to move on and talk about some of the environmental factors or the physical features of streams themselves. And we'll break this down into five major categories. We'll talk about flow, we'll talk about light, we'll talk about temperature, we'll talk about dissolved oxygen, and then we'll finish up with pH. Before I get rolling, I do want you to recognize that all of these factors are interrelated. Some of them affect one another, and they all affect the organisms that live within the stream. To begin talking about flows, the first thing that we want to consider is, well, where do streams come from? How does the water actually get to the stream in the first place? Imagine, if you will, the cross-section of a hill slope. We have a solid orange line indicating the surface of the hill slope, a dashed orange line indicating the layer of topsoil, underneath which are other sediments or other geologic features. And then ultimately down at the bottom we see that blue dashed line which is the water table where we have saturated sediments or soils. The stream itself is in the depression off to your right. This is where the water table gets expressed at the surface. Now the way that we get water into this stream happens four basic ways. First of all is direct input snow, rain, falling directly from the sky, fall into the depression and start forming the stream. Second is something called overland flow. And any of us that used to play in the streets with leaf packs and clog up the sewer gutters understand this concept very well. Because when it rains, the water is funneled down into the gutters and this is overland flow. We see the water actually running off the surface of the land and it goes into the stream directly. Then we have something called shallow subsurface flow, where the water actually percolates into the topsoil and then slowly moves downslope until it emerges into the stream itself. Lastly, we have something called groundwater input or groundwater flow, where the water has now percolated all the way through the sediments into the water table itself and slowly moves through the sediments and is expressed in the stream. So now we have the four ways to get water into the stream. Let's talk about flow itself within the stream. In order to understand the basics of flow in streams, I would like to introduce you to three basic terms. The first of which is velocity. Velocity is simply the speed of the water itself. How fast does the water go from point A to point B? The second is discharge. Discharge is different from velocity because now we're talking about volume, the actual amount of water that can pass a given point in a particular time period. Lastly, we talk about this idea of power. The stream has an ability to do work. It has the ability to move sediments, to erode banks. Power is generally influenced by the levels of discharge and velocity.
Now, one of the more common ways that stream ecologists consider flow is using something called a hydrograph. A hydrograph looks at the changes in discharge over a given amount of time. One of the hydrographs that we consider is something called a storm event hydrograph. This is on the scale of maybe a few days. And so what we have is a graph that looks at change in discharge on the y-axis and then the days across the x-axis or horizontal. We start off in a situation known as base flow. This is where the flows aren't changing a whole lot, the discharge isn't bouncing around. It's basically normal conditions. And then there's the storm event. After the storm event, what we see is a very steep rising limb that peaks, which is then followed by a more gradual recession limb. In contrast, the recession limb is driven then primarily by subsurface flow and groundwater input. These are much slower, and so the slope is much more gradual as the stream recovers to base flow. Another type of hydrograph that we can consider looks at the change in discharge over an annual basis. Now in Wisconsin, we have two basic types of stream systems based on their annual hydrographs. The first of which is called a snowmelt system. A snowmelt system results in very high variable flows that occur during spring because of snow melt and rainstorm events within that season. During the rest of the year, the flows generally taper off and become more even as the water input is reduced. The second type of system that we have in Wisconsin is something called a regulated system. Regulated systems have structures such as dams and other flood control devices that basically even out the hydrograph and reduce any of the peaks that we saw with the snowmelt system. We have to keep in mind that regulated systems impact the stream communities because the stream communities have evolved to adapt to the changes in flows that we saw with the snowmelt system. In a regulated system, there are no changes, and so the organisms are now having to deal with the lack of higher flows and then a base flow condition. Another way that flow impacts a stream has to do with the habitat within the stream itself. And we can actually classify different types of habitat within a stream based on the flow that we see within that particular site or stream. You may be familiar with the concepts of pools and riffles. Pools generally being deeper, slow-moving water, riffles being faster, shallow-moving water. Now, along this spectrum from slow-moving to fast-moving water, we can add some other types of habitats. For example, a glide or a run would fit somewhere in between a pool and a riffle. We have rapids and cascades much faster than a riffle, and then ultimately, it doesn't get much faster than a waterfall where the water is clearly in a free fall pretty fast. An understanding of flows can also help us understand a very simple question. And that question is, well, why aren't streams straight? The answer to this has to do with the way that flows react with the landscape as they move from point A to point B. So for example, valleys and the floodplains that the streams flow down and through are not generally very even, they're not smoothly sloped, and they're certainly not level. So we shouldn't expect streams to just kind of book it right down through the middle of any floodplain or valley. So we'll get rid of this idea. The second is that when we look at a floodplain or a valley, we need to recognize that the soils and the sediments that exist within that floodplain or valley are incredibly variable from one place to the next. Lastly, we need to recognize that streams will always take the path of least resistance. Not necessarily the most direct route, but the route that gives them the least amount of resistance. So as the stream deals with these three factors, what we begin to see on the landscape are bends or meanders. And the bends and the meanders are 
also created by the flow itself. Allow me to explain. When we go and look at the straight section of a stream, we see that the primary flow or the majority of the flow is occurring in the middle of the stream. Then as the resistance changes and the stream starts to cut away in a given area, the center part of the flow actually moves out to the outside edge of the bend and starts cutting away at the outside end of the bend. We get what's called erosion. Then it goes back across the middle of the stream as the bend finishes up and moves to the outermost edge of the next meander, again cutting its way down through the valley looking for the path of least resistance. Now on the inside of these meanders or bends, the water is very slow and shallow and so what we get is an area called depositional areas. This is where the sediments drop out because the water doesn't have as much power because it's not as moving as fast. We can look at this using an illustration of an actual meander and look at the cross-section area of it. The area of maximum velocity or the area where the water is moving fastest in a meander bend is on the outer edge at the surface. This is where the primary cutting or primary erosion is occurring. Then as we move into the shallows of the meander bend, the water gets slower and slower. Along with meanders, we need to recognize their role within a stream ecosystem. Meanders are important because they control flow rates. The more a stream has to move side to side, the slower the flow is going to be versus a straight channel or a pipe. Two, they provide habitat, and anybody that's been out fishing knows that you want to look for the big deep pools. So the meanders themselves cutting away at the banks create habitat. Lastly, we need to recognize that meanders are dynamic. They will change on the landscape as the stream looks for the path of least resistance. And allow me to illustrate this last point. Say, for example, we have this meander bend here, and you can see that the water goes towards this log jam. It bends off to the left and then meanders back around the trees and into the back of our picture. This is at base flow conditions, so we have this nice S-shaped meander. However, during high flow conditions, what we see is that the stream actually decides it's quicker to get from point A to point B if it cuts right through and forms a new channel. Again, the idea that the stream is looking for the path of least resistance, not always the most direct. Now that we have a basic understanding of the physical characteristics of flow and how they may change over time, I'd like to talk briefly about how flows actually influence the organisms within streams themselves. One of the things that organisms need to deal with are the forces that impact the organism due to the velocity and flow of water as it's moving past them. Now to deal with these forces, we have two different options if you're a stream organism. One is to adapt this streamlined body form. Basically what this does is it reduces the turbulence that exists around your body decreasing the different types of forces that are impacting you at any given time. The second way is to actually adapt body forms or lifestyles that take you to the bottom of the stream where the flows are less fast and therefore have less power so they're less likely to pick you up and move you away. Now this may include actually learning how to sprawl out and cling onto rocks or actually building some weight or some ballast. Because of these adaptations, we can begin to characterize streams and their communities simply based on how fast the water is flowing. We can imagine that in fast water streams, we would have a completely different suite of organisms than those that live in slow water streams because of the adaptations required to live in a fast flowing environment. Now that we've done with flow, what I'd like to move on to is light and the influence of light in stream ecosystems. In order to understand the role of light, we need to start with the sources of energy within streams. 
When we talk about the source of energy within any living system, the ultimate source of energy is sunlight. Now in streams, this energy from the sun gets put into the stream community through two different pathways. The first of which is very simple to imagine. We have the sun over the stream, the sunlight is penetrating the stream, it's interacting with the algae and the plants within the stream and they're using that sunlight and converting it to different forms of energy that can be used by other organisms. This is something we call autochthonous production, the production within the stream itself. Now the other type of production that occurs is something called allochthonous production where the sunlight energy is actually first converted by streamside vegetation and then later transferred to the stream ecosystem which is used by other organisms within the community. The factors then that influence the amount of light that can reach our autochthonous producers or our in-stream producers include the following. One, streamside vegetation. The the vegetation that exists on both banks of the stream may shade out the light that's able to reach the stream. But we have to remember that this streamside vegetation may be important from an allochthonous production perspective as well. Another thing that influences light, the time of day, the angle of the sun, the seasons and the climate, again the angle of the sun, water depth, the deeper the water, the harder it is for sunlight to penetrate. Surface roughness, the rougher the surface, the harder it is for sunlight to penetrate that water. And last but not least, something we call turbidity and water clarity. Now I'd like to spend a little bit of time talking about turbidity and water clarity because these are things that are often measured by water monitors. Turbidity and water clarity are often used interchangeably, but I would like to point out that there is actually a technical difference between the two. Turbidity is generally a measure of the suspended particles within the water. So we have little particles that are floating around in the water column and they prevent light from passing through the water. Water clarity is a quality that considers both the suspended particles and the color of the water itself. So say for example your stream has rust or iron colored water, that in addition to the suspended solids would be something we would consider water clarity. Water clarity is important and you monitor it because it influences the ability of sunlight to reach the autochthonous producers as we've mentioned. It influences the effectiveness of visual predators. Imagine, if you will, trying to hunt down prey within a dense fog. This is kind of what we ask fish to do when the water's very turbid. Last but not least, water clarity or turbidity may influence temperature. The reason for this is that different particles may absorb different amounts of energy and therefore warm up the water itself. Water clarity is actually influenced by a number of different things, including erosion, both from natural and human sources. Flows, as the discharge and the velocity increases, the power increases so we can carry more particles. The litter from the riparian vegetation, as things fall into the stream, they're broken down into smaller particles, adding to the particles within the water column that reduce water clarity. The underlying geology, whether or not the parent material is actually erodible itself. Then there's algal growth. The more algae we have in the water, the lower the water clarity because the less light can pass through it. And last, the biotic community. The biotic community is everything aside from the algae that eat the algae. So they may actually clear up the water for us. Now let's move on to temperature and how temperature impacts our streams. Temperature is important because it regulates the rate of chemical reactions within streams. It influences the amount of stuff that we can actually dissolve in water, which is why we warm up water if we want to dissolve, say, salt or other things in it. It also influences the metabolic rate of organisms. The warmer it is in the stream, the higher the metabolic rate and so the more energy they need to expend. It also influences a whole suite of other variables that we simply just don't have time to talk about.
Stream temperature itself is actually influenced by many of the things that we talked about with light. Things like the sunlight, the riparian vegetation, but we also have, an, have factors like groundwater inputs where springs are upwelling into the stream that may actually cool the, the water down. There's the width and the depth that allow sunlight penetration. Upstream factors, what happens in the watershed up above that may be influencing temperature? And lastly, water clarity. The amount of particles within the water may actually dictate the temperature of the water itself. As a stream monitor, you're likely measuring stream temperature. And you've likely been told that you need to measure it consistently in the same time of day. The reason for this is that temperatures fluctuate within a stream over a 24-hour period. For example, if we think about a stream site that has an open canopy or may have no groundwater inputs or springs, we can see a drastic change from cold water temperatures in the early morning to warm water temperatures later in the afternoon within a single 24-hour period. Stream systems that may have a closed canopy or high amounts of groundwater input may not have such a drastic difference in temperatures, yet some temperature difference will still exist. Stream organisms can be divided into two basic groups based on how they deal with stream temperatures. The first group is called stenotherms, often called cold water species. Stenotherms only exist in a very narrow range of temperatures. These are exemplified by the salmon and the trout. The other type of organism based on temperature is the urotherms, generally called warm water species. These organisms can exist in a very wide range of temperatures, including things like our bass and our suckers. Another way to think about temperatures has to do with how the temperature differs within a 24-hour period depending on where you are within a watershed. If your stream system is small and in a headwater site, you may not see very many temperature differences between night and day. Whereas in a medium-sized system, you're likely to see the greatest range of temperature differences. Ultimately, as you move on to a large river system, something like the Mississippi, again, the differences will be fairly low. In the headwater systems, generally we have a lot of riparian vegetation, or we're talking about a spring-driven system. So the temperatures really don't fluctuate a whole lot in a 24-hour period. In contrast, in a large river system, we're talking about a massive amount of water. Now, changing the temperature of a massive amount of water requires a lot of energy. So large rivers have what we call thermomomentum. That means that they maintain their temperature over a significant period of time because it requires so much energy for them to change. Now let's talk about dissolved oxygen. The amount of dissolved oxygen within a stream is a function of three primary things, first of which is the exchange that the stream has with the air. So in riffle areas, we would imagine a high degree of exchange, so there would be high levels of oxygen. Two is biological activity, which basically has to do with photosynthesis, the production of oxygen, and respiration, the consumption of oxygen. During the day, photosynthesis is done by algae and plants, which increases oxygen levels. However, at night, all organisms are using oxygen, and so the oxygen levels decrease. The last thing that has to do with the amount of oxygen in the stream has to do with temperature. What may seem counterintuitive is that actually colder water can hold more oxygen. Colder waters hold more gases. I know it sounds weird, but trust me on that one. One of the questions that comes up with dissolved oxygen is the idea of saturation. And you may have heard this before in your monitoring groups. Saturation is the idea that we can put only so much oxygen into a given amount of water within a given temperature and barometric pressure. So 
when we pack as much oxygen into the water as we can, we've reached 100% saturation. Ah, you're thinking, yeah, but I've heard this idea of supersaturation. Well, supersaturation actually means that we go above 100%. And this can only occur when the production of oxygen or the input of oxygen exceeds the rate at which oxygen is leaving the stream. Usually this is happening during the middle of the day when the sunlight and the photosynthesis is going at full steam. Much like temperature, dissolved oxygen will fluctuate over a 24 hour period. And in fact, the curves for an open site versus a closed site are going to look very similar to the temperature. An open site, we will see high amounts of oxygen during the afternoon hours because the sunlight has been working with plants and algae to make oxygen through photosynthesis, whereas at night and early morning, we're going to see the lowest amounts of oxygen because the respiration has been occurring. In a shaded site, we won't see the differences between night and day simply because we don't have the amount of algae and primary producers that we would normally have in an open site. So the peaks and the troughs won't be as drastic. Let's move on to our last factor, pH. pH is something that we commonly measure in stream ecology and sometimes we measure it without really considering even what it is. So what is pH and why is it important? pH very simply is a measure of a liquid's acidity, how acid is something. Well, what does being acid mean? L let me try and explain this as simply as possible. Imagine, if you will, if you're a molecule and you're a molecule of water, which means that you're H2O. You have two hydrogens and one oxygen. Now, most of your friends within a bucket of water exist as H2O. So you're all molecules of H2O happy floating around. However, within this bucket of water, some of the molecules don't really hold themselves together so well, and they disassociate or break up into different parts. The hydrogen becomes a hydrogen ion, and the oxygen and other hydrogen become the hydroxyl. Now, in most buckets of water and most streams, the water exists as H2O, but some of it will disassociate into the hydrogen ion and the hydroxyl. So we'll have all three of these within a given unit of water. Now here's the kicker. pH is the measure of the hydrogen ion present in the water. So the more hydrogen ions we have, the more acid-like the water is. Acids have high concentrations of hydrogen ions. Bases, which are the opposite of acids, have low concentrations of hydrogen ions. Now this all sounds fine and dandy. Then we bring in the scale at which we measure pH. The scale at which we measure pH goes from 0 to 14. Now, a pH that is neutral, so pure water, is actually at 7. Acids or strong acids go down from 7 to 0. Strong bases go from 7 to 14. Now you're probably asking yourself, well, how come the lower the number, the stronger the acid? But you just said the more the hydrogen ions, the greater the acid. Great question. The reason for this, and let me try to explain, is that pH is a negative log number. That's about it. That's what I'll leave it at. To give you an idea of where some common items fall on this pH scale, we can think of battery acid, which is a very strong acid, somewhere down around 1. Rainwater, which is slightly acidic, is somewhere around 6. Pure water, again, is at 7. And then household ammonia, the stuff that some of us use to clean up our houses, is somewhere around 11. It's actually a medium base. Now, as acids, things like acid rain and pollution, are added to our stream, the amount of hydrogen ions increase, and so the pH gets 
closer and closer to zero. Streams and many of the streams that you'll be working with generally exist within a range of say six to eight on the pH scale. When streams start to get below a pH of six, that's when we should probably start getting concerned because now we're getting pretty acidic. Now the reason why we get concerned with changes in pH levels is because pH affects the rate of chemical reactions, the amount of materials that we can dissolve in the water, the amount of nutrients that are actually available to our primary producers like algae and plants, and pH also affects the general health and performance of stream organisms. Now that we've covered the five primary physical characteristics of streams and the characteristics that you are likely to be involved with as a monitor, I'd like to address probably the question that you'd really like to ask right now. And that question is, well now that I know all this, what should I expect in my stream? Great question! And you know what? I'd love to answer it for you. And so my answer is, I have no idea. I have no idea. And I, let me explain. The reason for this is that streams not only vary so greatly from one place to the next, but they also differ within themselves. And so knowing exactly what to expect from one site to the next, from one stream to the next, is very difficult to imagine. Now I know that sounds like a bummer, but I must tell you all is not lost. And I will give you a glimpse of hope. I would like to introduce you to the idea of the river continuum concept. The river continuum concept was a rather elegant concept put together to illustrate how streams might change as you go from very small headwaters to large river type systems. What it does is it takes into consideration the stream size and then the influence of the riparian vegetation or stream side vegetation and how those two things influence the communities that exist within the stream at any given point. Allow me to illustrate. If we talk about a system that is way up in the headwaters, maybe it's just a spring that's just coming out of the ground and we see this little trickle. We notice that it's a very small system, so it doesn't have a whole lot of surface area for sunlight penetration and that the riparian area or that the, the vegetation growing up alongside of it must have a fairly large impact on that system. So it's primarily driven by a lochthinous production or production from outside of the system. This would hold true as well when we move down into maybe a first order or small spring or creek and again, the riparian vegetation is highly prevalent. It's shading much of the stream. Not a whole lot of sunlight's able to get in, so there's not a lot of autochthonous production. So the system might be largely driven by a lochthonous production. Now we would expect then to see other organisms, macroinvertebrates and fish, that would then use the lochthonous material for that part of the stream. Let's move down a little bit. The stream starts getting a little bit larger. The role of the vegetation becomes less and less as the system gets wider and wider and the canopy becomes more open and more open and we move down in the system. Now when we're talking about a mid-sized stream, we're talking about a lot of sunlight that can penetrate the stream. The stream isn't too deep so that the water, the sunlight can penetrate all the way through the water. We get production occurring at the bottom of the stream as well as within the water column. Great levels of diversity. We see autochthonous production. We see a lochthonous production occurring. The mid-sized streams generally will have the greatest diversity of any of the streams on our landscape. Then we move on to larger systems and ultimately into a big river system where here the diversity is going to go back down because here the role of the riparian vegetation is fairly limited. This, 
system is generally pretty low in water clarity because it's very turbid, which is why we get muddy, large rivers. So the sunlight can't penetrate much of the water. We don't get a lot of autochthonous production. Most of the energy is simply coming from upstream sources. And so we only have organisms that are able to utilize energy from upstream sources or allochthonous production. In closing, I'd like you to remember one very, very important point. And that is, remember, streams are dynamic. Stream ecologists and stream monitors need to consider that streams are always going to change. And they're going to change in space, and they're going to change in time. To illustrate this, allow me to introduce you to the four dimensions of a stream ecosystem. Remember when you're out in the stream that there are four dimensions impacting your site or your stream. There's the lateral dimension, the dimension of the water and the riparian zone from side to side or bank to bank. There's the longitudinal dimension, the dimension of water moving from upstream to downstream. There's a vertical dimension of water interacting between the groundwater or subsurface area and the surface water. And last but not least, there's time. Remember back to the meander discussion. As the water flows increase, the stream will change from one position to the next. So our four dimensions, the lateral, the longitudinal, and the vertical, along with time, will always change. With that, I'd like to say thank you. Thank you for participating as a water monitor, and good luck on your monitoring efforts.